have an equal. And while we acknowledge and believe that to be true, the truth of the history of God's people is they haven't always behaved that way. We started a series last week looking through uh, Elijah's life, 1 Kings 17 through 19. And, and what we noticed last week, some of the context, in case you weren't here, in case you have forgotten uh, these parts of Elijah's life, is that the people of God have been in 62 years of cultural decline. They had started their kingdom in Israel. They were started to be led by kings, and they watched as Saul and David and Solomon led them well. And then after Solomon died, the kingdom split. A number of the tribes decided they didn't want the rightful heir to be the throne, Solomon's son, to actually be king. They wanted his, the, army of his, the general of his army to be king. And so uh, two kingdoms were made. And through the rest of the Old Testament, we see this division of the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south or as they will call them, the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. We looked last week as the kingdom of the north then has split off. It's had seven different kings or three families different on the throne. And we're in that third family and it's been 62 years since that split. And a man named Ahab has become king. Ahab, like the rest of the kings before him, did more evil than all of his father or more evil than all of the other kings. First Kings 16 says it this way about him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, one of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He put a rival alongside God. He married Jezebel, who was uh, from Sidon, a Phoenician woman who was a priestess of Baal and Asherah, the, the male and female gods of the Phoenician people. And they began then, collectively, as they ruled over the people of God, to promote not just worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, but also the worship of Baal and of Asherah. They built temples for them and poles for them to be worshipped in. Ahab, as he's been leading, has led the people continuously further into this decline. 62 years of going against God's values, going against God's hope, going against God's promises. 62 years of decline. And it begs the question, what's God going to do? How is God going to restore his people? How is he going to change their hearts back towards him? How is he going to redeem them? And the answer is through a man named Elijah. He's going to use a man named Elijah. A man, as our series title would say, a man like us. I chose those words, not out of the air, but from James chapter 5. When James is speaking of the way God works, particularly the way God works in prayer, he talks about Elijah as an example and said, Elijah was a human being even as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. As James is talking about Elijah, that translation says he was a human being like we are. Your translation may say he has the same nature as we do. And one translation says in the way that I've chosen it for the screen, he is a man just like us. After 62 years of decline and when culture has turned completely away from God and God is trying to recapture its heart, he uses a man, a human being, somebody with a nature just like ours. And as we beg the question, what's it look like in our society where we may disagree on if it's been 62 years or longer or if it's been a little shorter than that, but we may all agree that our culture has declined and it's gotten further and further away from God's values and further and further away from what he would hope for his people. We may be asking the question, how is God going to work in our midst? And I would argue, as I did last week, maybe the same as he has in history before. He's going to use people just like you and people just like me, who are going to pray for big things, who are going to be obedient in small things as well, and see God move in our worlds. Last week we showed, we watched as, as Elijah shows up on the scenes and begins that thing that James said. He shows up to King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and he says to them, there's not going to be any more rain. It won't rain in this land again until I say so. 
Elijah says. And then he disappears from the scene of the, the kingdom of the north, of the kingdom of Israel. And he's, God leads him into hiding, first in the Kareth Ravine on the east side of the Jordan River. And then as the brook there dries up, he takes him north to Sidon, the area Jezebel was from, where the, the worship would have started of these false gods. He says, go and live there for a while and a widow will take care of you. And we see then as he's fed by ravens, fed by uh, flour and oil that doesn't run out. And then ultimately as he prays and cries out to God and brings someone back to life as God uses him in those ways. A sidebar of just stories of Elijah. But in those three stories, nothing changes in Israel. It's gone from 62 years of slow decline to 65 years of decline. Three more years of just turning away from God. Three more years of false worship. Three more years of a rival next to God. Maybe even one who has trumped him now in Baal. And the series focuses itself back on what's happening in Israel. It says in verse eight, uh, chapter 18, After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Just to orient you all on the map again, if you were here the last week, this is grayed out map is the entire kingdom of the north of Israel. The circle on the right hand side there is the circle on the east side of the Jordan River. That's both where Elijah was from and where he went the first time to go into hiding. He went on the east side of the Jordan River to the Kareth Ravine where he's fed by the ravens. And then as that dried up, God said, now I want you to leave there and I want you to go to Sidon, the region of Sidon. That's all the way in the north, the highlighted circle up top there, right on the borders of Syria uh, and Lebanon. It's where Jezebel would have been from and it's where the worship of Baal started. And God says, go there and a widow, the lowliest of all of the people, is going to take care of you and direct supply for you there. And so he spent a time there. It's likely he spent about six months in the Kareth Ravine and likely he spent about two and a half years in Sidon. It's been three years. It says after a long time, it's been three years. God speaks to him again and says, now it's time. Now it's time to go back and finish what you started with Ahab three years ago. Let's go, to go and talk about the rain again. Go and I will send rain this time. And so Elijah leaves Sidon in the top and he's going back to that the one on the left there. He's going all the way back down to Samaria where Ahab has made the capital for the people of God, the capital for Baal worship as well. So Elijah's walking back down there. And while he's doing so, I imagine this plan still just doesn't make sense. Everything Elijah's done so far, I would think he would want the opposite of it to happen. He's just told the guy, I can make it rain. And then that's about to happen. And I bet if I was the prophet, these are reasons why I'm not. You'll recognize Elijah's just way better than me. If I was the prophet, I'd say, I want to be known for that. And so while that's happening, while the rain's not coming, like I want to be traveling around and being telling people like, I did that. I prayed that prayer and God answered it. I'm the reason there's no rain. Y'all, you want to know when it comes back? I get to decide. I'll wait. When God tells me, I'll be the one who speaks it back. When he would have maybe been tempted to have a very public ministry, God says, leave and go into hiding. And now it's been three years. Three years and everybody, not just Ahab, everybody's starting to get pretty frustrated with the fact that they can't grow crops, that there's no grass for their animals to graze on, their livestock are suffering, there's famine everywhere. And he's to blame for it. And now God says, okay, go make yourself public again. And I imagine now he's like, no, no, I'd rather keep hiding now. Like everybody's mad. Nobody, nobody's going to celebrate me anymore. And yet God says, That's, it's time to go. The verses continue. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. A new character shows up on the screen. His name is Obadiah. What we know from this verse is that he's the king's palace administrator. And save for that fact, I imagine unless within the last week you read in advance this story, pretty much none of you can tell me anything of note about Obadiah. Somebody here is thinking, 
But I know there's a book in the Old Testament named Obadiah, right? Like there's a minor prophet called Obadiah, and you would be right. That's a different Obadiah. That guy comes up like two or three hundred years later. Not the same guy. Different guy at this time. Most of us don't know anything about him. I'm going to guess, unfortunately, six months from now, most of us still won't know much about him. We'll forget everything I say about him for 30 minutes today. He's a small character in Elijah's story, a small character in the way God's going to move, but one we're going to study today. This 18 verses we're going to look at today say everything we know about this person. I'm going to jump ahead a verse to verse 5 where it tells us what, what Obadiah summoned him for. Or what Ahab summoned him for. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover. Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah going in another. Ahab's been lifted up in the palace. He's been working alongside King Ahab and has been charged with administering everything that's needed. Picture it if you remember like Joseph's role alongside Pharaoh. He's been there in a time of famine and in an effort to help the people of God try and figure out how to survive, how to live well, and he gets to kind of oversee that. And so Ahab is brought him forward. He says, here's what we need to do now. Things have gotten so drastic after three years. We're looking for any little bit of grass so we don't have to kill all of, all of our horses and our mules. So why don't, why don't you, Obadiah, go search part of the land and I'll go search part of the land and we'll see if we can just find enough so that we don't have to slaughter our royal animals. And so Obadiah and Ahab have left the capital of Samaria in pursuit of any small brook or stream that has some grass growing near it so that their animals can stay alive. Before that, the verse I skipped, it's a parenthetical statement. It tells us a little bit about Obadiah. It says this, Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and he had supplied them with food and water. This would have been uh, hard. He had to keep it in hiding because remember, it's the queen. It's his boss that's killing off all of the prophets. And he's saying, I don't want that to happen. I'm a devout believer, it tells us. I, I believe faithfully in the God of Israel and the God Yahweh, and I want to serve him well, and so I don't want his word to stop going forth. I want his prophets to stay alive. And so he's a devout believer working in secret to keep them alive because devout believers are exactly what are being killed. It is clear Ahab and Jezebel would not have known Obadiah was doing this. They would have killed him had they found out. And yet... It's left for us in parentheses. I actually highlighted the parentheses as well. It's just background information we're supposed to know. It's not the major point. We may remember it as the coolest thing Obadiah does as he serves God. The big awesome step he took to save a hundred people. But I want to remind us, that's not why he's in Scripture. That's not what he's included in the story for. It's not why God inspired him for all time to read about who he was. In fact, he's put in here because of a conversation he's going to have with Elijah and a conversation he's going to have with Ahab. Two short conversations are the reason he shows up in Scripture. But, but this parenthetical statement, it's there for us to, to add to the story, to have a little background depth to what's actually going on. Now, I was in third grade when I first started to understand uh, what parentheses were for. I remember being in a class and we were reading through stories and we would rotate through who was reading out loud for the class, something everybody hated, not because you didn't mind reading out loud, but because you realized nobody paid attention. You were just looking ahead to see what you were supposed to read next and try to make sure you didn't mess up. You weren't listening to what anybody else read. You were just trying to get through it. The whole thing would be read and you didn't recognize any of what was said. But I remember being confused by wondering why some kids read out loud what was in the parentheses and some kids didn't read out loud what was in the parentheses. And so I just simply asked my teacher somewhere around third grade, are we supposed to read the things in parentheses or not? 
I remember my teacher saying something along these lines. The things that are in parentheses are supposed to add to a story. They're of benefit for you. They expand and give greater depth to what's going on. But they are unnecessary to the story. You can skip them and you don't miss anything important. By nature, that's what we do with things in parentheses like this. In Obadiah's story, we get some background knowledge that he's a devout believer uh, and that some of the things he's done, but that's not what matters. That detail could be gone, and it wouldn't make a difference how he interacts with Elijah, except for the fact that he's going to bring that story up. We'll see that in just a moment. As he's out searching for grass, as Obadiah was walking along, verse 7 says, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. The most important thing Obadiah is going to do happens while he's out searching for grass and is a conversation that's going to take just a couple of minutes. He's going to think the most important thing he's done is save a hundred prophets. But we'll find out he's wrong most important thing he's going to do is a short conversation. Here's how he responds. What have I done wrong, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? As surely as the Lord your God lives, there's not a nation or a kingdom where a master has not sent someone to look for you. Whenever that nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. Obadiah recognizes Elijah because Elijah was like the biggest wanted poster in all of Samaria. Ahab's been searching for him for three years. As the rain has stopped, as the famine has hit, as they're wondering how to grow crops and feed their animals, Ahab's saying, where's the man who said he could make it rain again whenever he spoke it? We need to find him. And so they've gone searching, not just in the area around Samaria. It says they've gone searching in other nations and kingdoms, and they couldn't find him. So much so that when they would go to a kingdom, and that kingdom would be like, no, we haven't seen him. We don't know where he is. They'd be like, you need to swear on that, because if we find out you're wrong, there's punishment coming to your entire kingdom. Ahab's been, being, been searching for Elijah for a long time. And so Obadiah says, wait a minute, I've probably given that oath to Ahab, that I have no idea where you are, that I've had no contact with you, that I don't, that I don't know anything about your whereabouts. And now you want me to go to him and say, hey, I met with Elijah. He's, he's promised he'd be killing people who knew where you were and didn't tell him. And now I'm supposed to go tell him I know where you are? What have I done? Why are you punishing me? You're leading me to be put to death. There's a tension that can happen in our world, that happened for Obadiah, where we find ourselves in a position, a position where our primary influence is with people who are far from God. He's in the kingdom. He's got a prominent role as second in command, as administrator. And he recognizes that influence and he's a devout believer and he wants to use it well. And yet he's also in tension of saying, but certain things I do, if I make my faith public, if I'm too blunt and too bold about them, I'll lose my life. Some of you may face that tension. How do I live out my faith well? How do I serve God well while working as a CEO or as a manager in a company that doesn't promote things of God? How do I work well as I teach in the public schools or attend a public school as, as someone who may be ridiculed or punished for living out my faith publicly and boldly? How do I balance the line of wanting to serve God well and yet wanting to retain the position of influence I have? It's a tension that isn't unique to Obadiah. It's a tension that happens in our world all of the time. It's a tension that no doubt happens in the same political ways. Undoubtedly, we have people of faith serving well in positions of influence in our political environment of our culture. 
And yet we watch and say, then how are we declining so much? People of influence with a focus to say, I want to serve God well. And yet I have to be sensitive to what it may do. I want to serve God well. I want to, I want to save a hundred prophets. And yet if, I've got to be sensitive that if that gets found out, I'll die. In fact, if it gets found out how publicly devout I am to God, I may likely die. And what I recognize in Obadiah's life, what I've recognized in the experiences of many in our world, is that as we live in that tension, God will use us. It's a valuable place to be, and God often puts people in those places to be used. And yet the longer we're in that tension, the quicker we start to ask the question, but what about me? I don't want to do that hard, bold thing because that one might get me punished. I don't want to do that hard, bold thing because I might be noticed. I don't want to do that hard thing because I might have a hard relationship with my family. Remember, I don't want to say that blunt thing about who I believe God is because it might cause tension in my relationships, in my community, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, in my school, with my friends. And we go from asking a question about how do I serve God well in a position I am, and we begin to ask a question like, how do I make sure I stay comfortable and there's this slow switch from being people who want to serve God in a tense and difficult environment to being people who want to stay in the environment more than we want to serve God I think we're going to find Obadiah in that situation because Elijah shows up and he says I don't want to go back what are you doing to me He's looked everywhere for you. Verse 11 continues. But now you tell me to go to my master and say Elijah is here. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave. And if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Don't you understand if I go back, there's a lot on the line for me, and I don't know what, I don't know if I can trust you. You came on the scene three years ago and said that the rain would leave, and it did, and you disappeared. How do I know that's not what's going to happen again? I don't want to go back into my tense environment and tell my boss I found him, because I don't know if you'll actually come. I don't know if you'll actually show up. Elijah's saying things like, I don't know where Ahab is because you've told me he's out looking for grass. Could you use your resources to go find him, bring him back to Samaria? I'll meet him there. I'll go to his throne. Let's go there. I'll meet him. And, it, and Obadiah says, that might cost me something. And I don't want to pay what it might cost. I've served God since my youth. Do I really have to do this? This seems like punishment. And he goes on to then tell a story, to bring focus onto something that was intended to just be in parentheses. Verse 13. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. I'll rephrase it for him. Haven't I done enough for God? Don't you remember the big thing I've already done where I, I, took, I put my neck out on the line in secrecy to try to save a hundred of God's people? You were in hiding that whole time. Haven't I already done enough? Certainly I don't have to do anything more. I've been faithful to God since my youth. Remember the big thing I did? That's the thing that matters. That's the important story from my life. Let me just settle on that. Elijah won't even reference it. He doesn't answer the question. It actually just goes on to say, and now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here, he'll kill me. Don't you remember what I've done? I've played my part. 
I did my big thing. We've already accomplished the story I should be known for. Can I fade back now? Can I just keep my comfort, keep my role, keep working where I have influence? Can it just be made easy? Why do I have to be blunt with my faith? Why do I have to profess? Why do I have to come alongside what God is doing now? That's not my story. My story is the guy who did the hundred profit saving thing. Let's let that be my story. And I want to remind you, that was supposed to be in parentheses. When God put it as a, a wonderful addition, something that added to the story but was unnecessary, it was beautiful and showed that he was a devout believer. But when he tries to make it the point of the story, when he tries to highlight what he's done, it sounds like groveling and it sounds like complaining and it sounds like fear. And it sounds like an excuse. And it's listed as a negative. And Elijah ignores it. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I'll surely present myself to Ahab today. He mentions nothing about the prophets. He just says, just set up the meeting. I promise I'll go. Or he didn't say it this way, but let me rephrase it. Oh, but I don't you recognize when you go to Ahab, you'll be the hero of the story because you're going to bring in the guy he's been looking for for three years. But Ahab has gone from, from asking the question, how do I serve God in a place of tension? And instead has been asking the question, how do I serve myself and remain in a place of comfort? And he's so focused on himself, he never begs to ask the question, what's going to happen to Elijah when he shows up? He's so worried about what he's going to say to Ahab. And if Elijah will make it, he's not even giving a thought to What's going to happen when Elijah shows up? We'll end up seeing that story next week. It's the coolest miracle of Elijah's life with the calling down of fire from God and the prophets of Baal. And it's awesome. We'll get there next week. But in this moment, uh, Obadiah is being used as the one who prepares the way for that. He's setting up the meeting so God's big miracle can happen. And yet he's refusing to initially because he wants to be remembered for something else and he wants to stay comfortable where he is. And so Elijah simply says, I'll present myself to Ahab today. Could you just go find him and set up the meeting? So Obadiah went and met Ahab wherever he was out looking for grass and told him. And then Ahab left there to go meet with Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Chances are, if you brought a Bible with you, almost no matter what translation you're reading, it says something like that, you troubler of Israel. And that saddens me. It's one of the few times where, where I wish that the translators put more depth into the way they translated some of the words from Hebrew. And so I want to give you a paraphrase uh, of a way I think it may better be translated. Ahab sees the man he's been looking for for three years, the man who he's only seen one time before, and the time he see, saw him it was when Elijah said, I'm the one now that gets to control rain. Because of the God I serve, it's going to stop raining until I speak that back into existence. And that's happened. It's been three years, and there's been no rain. And so Elijah shows up on the scene, and Ahab looks at him and says, hey, is that you, the one who has cursed us? The one who's worked with dark forces against us. The one who's connived with the deepest, darkest kind of spiritual things and put a hex on all of Israel. Ahab at this time assumes that what Elijah has done has not been by the power of God. He assumes it has been by dark forces. That's what he means when he says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Are you the one who's caused this deep darkness by working alongside dark forces for the negative consequences of Israel? And Elijah answers, I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not the one who's worked with the dark forces. I'm not the one who has led Israel astray. I'm not the one who is aligned with the wrong kinds of things and cursed Israel. I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. 
You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. If somebody's aligned with the dark forces of this world, it's you and your dad and the kingdoms before you. You're the ones who have led us astray. You're the ones who have brought in worship of the false things. You think it's been bad for people and that they've suffered because they didn't have rain? No, 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 no. They've suffered because you've led them into false worship. That is far dire a consequence for their life, particularly for their eternity than three years without rain. Now the suffering of the people and the darkness of the people has come not because there's been no rain, it's come because you and your family and your father's family abandoned God and started to worship the Baals instead. You're the ones who have aligned with darkness. That conversation that Elijah and Ahab, Ahab's have set up this confrontation and this miracle that's gonna take place that we'll look at next week. And it ends Obadiah's story. 18 verses he's a part of a conversation with Elijah and a conversation with Ahab and then he's gone. He's included in scripture because of those conversations and yet what he longs to be remembered for is saving a hundred prophets. Chances are, like many of you didn't know much about Obadiah before, my guess would be six months from now if I ask you who Obadiah is, you'll say something like, all I know is there's two of them. That's it. You'll remember that there's one that wrote the book, and now you'll remember there's one that didn't. When it's six months from now, you might even be lucky to remember that he was part of Elijah's story. You may not even remember that much of it. It's just the way it goes. I've preached enough sermons to know how quickly we forget these kinds of things. A man whose story was supposed to be in parentheses. And yet he brought focus on it. It's been 65 years of cultural decline and God wants to work in his life to prepare the way for one of the greatest miracles he's going to do to restore proper worship and all of God's people and yet Obadiah tries to avoid it because he wants to remain comfortable, because he's thinking about his own story, because he's convinced he did enough. The truth of the matter for all of us is when we're focused on our own story, we behave poorly. When we try to highlight what it is that we've done, when we try to put spotlight on what is only supposed to be a parenthetical statement, we make poor decisions. We give ourselves more credit than is due, and we avoid doing the new things, the simple things, the small things, the conversations that God is asking for us, as if we've earned our right to say, no, I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to do theirs. I want to remind you, I want to remind me, your personal story and my personal story are not and will never be the most important story. The most important story is always that of Jesus. His story and his story alone is the one that matters. And ours should be a parenthetical statement alongside it. It should not matter if our story is noticed. It should not matter if people pay attention to what we've done. It should always matter that Jesus' story is told and that if somebody chooses to look at your story, if somebody chooses to pay attention to what's in the parentheses, it should add to Jesus' story, not yours. If somebody watches your life and pays attention to your story, it should bring greater depth to Jesus' story, not simply to your own. I, I wrote it there on the screen. I will admit, if you pay attention to the rules of grammar, the sentence on the screen does not make sense. I put the parentheses there for visual illustration. But our story should always be lived within the parentheses of Jesus' story. That is the story we want people to read. And we want our story simply to add value to that. And if we've ever screwed that up, if we ever like Obadiah for a moment, though he gets it right, let's give him the credit, he does do what Elijah asked him to do. But if we ever for a moment say, no, 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 Look at my story. Look at what I've done. I've already done my part. This is what I should be known for. I don't need to participate in the rest of God's story because that sounds hard and difficult and uncomfortable and will have consequence for me. Then we are missing it. 
Instead, if like Obadiah and Elijah, we watch and serve God, we live his story, we might see awesome things happen. We may be fed by ravens, or we may see handfuls of flour and a little jug of oil never run out. We may see people brought back to life. We may see a hundred prophets saved, and we may be able to stand as witness to one of the coolest miracles of a prophet calling down fire from heaven, like Obadiah got to witness and Elijah got to bring into existence through God's power, because we are serving God, where if instead we decide to serve ourselves, to simply live our story instead of God's story, we may end up in those moments like Obadiah was with a weak faith, scared of what may happen to us, convinced that that plan doesn't make sense and would never come to light, and we may miss out on the big things God wants to do. This is a simple question. It's a simple question. It's the title of the message on the back of your bulletin. Who do you serve? We'll look at the story next week, and that question will be, are you going to serve Baal or are you going to serve God? But as we look at it through Obadiah's story this week, it may be better asked, are you going to serve God or are you going to serve yourself? Are you going to live and only try to highlight your story? Are you going to live and try to highlight God's story and allow yours just to be lived within parentheses? Hopefully adding to his story, but never about you. Obadiah is in scripture because of two simple conversations he had. At some point, he may have wanted to be in scripture because of the prophet thing. But that's not why he's there. It's a parenthetical statement. He's there because he prepared the way for Elijah. No different than John the Baptist is in Scripture because he prepared the way for Jesus. No different than the church is supposed to live out as we prepare the way for our coming King. My hope and my prayer for you is that you will answer well, not that you serve yourself, but that you serve God. And that because of that, you'll live your life in parentheses of Jesus' story. That all you'll do will highlight his goodness and who he is. And he will get the credit and the glory. And if anybody pays attention and if anybody observes and if anybody writes the tale of your story someday, it will be as a parenthetical statement that adds value to what Jesus has done in the world. May we all be people who live adding value to what Jesus is accomplishing. Would you join me in a prayer that that would be true? God, I long, we long for your name to be glorified. We long in our culture that has declined for it to be redeemed and restored to your purposes and your values. And we believe that that can happen as you use men and women just like us. Men and women who prioritize our faith in you and in your story more than our comfort. Men and women who are willing to walk into tension Men and women who are willing to do the big things like save hundreds of prophets or the small things like have the simple conversations that prepare the way. Help us to be focused on who you are led by your power with your spirit placed inside of us and for your glory we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you go, I hope you go allowing your story to be lived within parentheses, focusing on making Jesus' story magnified. As you go, say hi to someone else who for all intents and purposes, story doesn't matter. You are dismissed.